Good afternoon. Um, yes, uh, so I will be talking on uh, more energetic uh, objects like lasers. So my main focus are gamma rays, and in particular, relativistic jets. Here, there is a list of um, the, the closer uh, collaborators for this particular work. But, but in general, I work on uh, gamma ray within the gamma ray community that uh, we actually work with a large collaboration like uh, Fermilab, Satellite, or Magic, uh, et cetera. And so first of all, um, just a bit of introduction on how the gamma ray sky looks like. Here we have a full sky image um, from Fermilab. So basically Fermilab is the satellite that is actually monitoring the full sky every three hours. Gamma ray sky is very valuable. So it's key to monitor um, with, uh, you know, with high cadence. Uh, most of the gamma ray emissions are red, means uh, emission, uh, blue means no emission, gamma ray emission. So as you can see, we are talking about the most energetic part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So uh, while looking at, at the sky map, we can see that most of the emission, including diffuse emission, is distributed along the galactic plane. So our emission from our galaxy. And when we go outside of our galaxy, uh, from the extragalactic sky, mainly what we have are point light sources. And all these point light sources mostly are more than 90% or 90 almost 99% of 98% of the targets are what we call uh, blazers. So blazers basically dominate the, the extragalactic gamma ray sky, right? So basically they are um, active galactic nuclei who, uh, which has jets more or less perpendicular to the uh, plane of the, of, the, of the disk. And these jets are pointing towards the earth or very close to the Earth. So there is some boosting of the emission, okay? So this, uh, this is basically the reason why these are more basically the object that we can see as at the most extreme uh, electromagnetic uh, radiation. Uh, so they emit, uh, actually this um, uh, jet emits through the entire electromagnetic um, spectrum from radio to very high energies to gamma. Uh, so basically here in the plot in the, on the right, uh, you can see uh, how the spectral energy distribution in a multi western context look like. So basically the, the structure from radio to very high energies, it looks like a double peak structure. And for the different uh, type of lasers, uh, the peaks uh, of, the, of this emission change the position and also it changed the ratio between the emission high energies and lower energies. Okay, so this is what the, the part of the, on the right, the higher frequency or higher energies, these are uh, the gamma rays. So the part I'm mostly uh, working on, observed with Fermi from the satellite and from the ground with Cherenkov telescopes at higher energies. Uh, and of course, in order to understand what is going on, the, pro the emission processes and so on, we need to have also the multi wavelength view uh, from radio and specifically, it is key to have optical and X-ray um, uh, information, you know, to, to have an idea of what kind of processes are, are behind this, this gamma emission. So here we have a sketch um, what we think are basically the, the, the standard um, uh, parts of this uh, kind of AGMs. So basically we have at the center, uh, the black hole surrounded by a concretion disk. Further away, there is what we call broad line region. This is basically emitting in, in optical and UV. And further away, there is the uh, dusty target basically emitting an infrared. So this is pretty conventional. And then from the jets that, as we were discussing before, are launched from the very close uh, from the um, uh, black hole, then um, within these relativistic jets, which are the ones pointing to our, to our us uh, in, in blazers, in the jets is the only part 
where uh, gamma rays can be produced. Okay, other parts of the of the uh, AGN can produce, uh, as I say, optical, infrared, etc. But gamma rays can only be produced in these relativistic jets. Uh, and in addition to gamma rays, as I say, it produces also optical from radio to to, to gamma rays. Um, and of course, uh, it is uh, well the, the main work here is to understand how these. Uh, powerful jets are able to accelerate particles in order to be able to emit gamma rays. There are not that many objects that emit gamma rays, so they are extreme uh, in this sense. So the, the standard idea that we have or we have been considering until now is that within the jet, we consider it, uh, one emitting region. This is what we have here in blue. The position of the emitting region, it can be closer to the blob and region or farther away where uh, infrared torus is, would be more important, uh, have an impact. And not only the position, but also um, good kind of uh, emitting region. Uh, the most standard view is just one emitting region, but we can have two like we have here in the plot, or even we can have one, but the small or, uh, you know, uh, together with another one or two emitting regions, but not connected one to the other. So basically there are many alternatives. So in order to investigate this, basically there are two main ways. Uh, the first one would be studying the time variability of multi wavelength light curve. Um, and then we can also study how um, how we can, um, or, or what we see from the spectral variability. So from the variability of the light curve, so basically you collect uh, the, the emission and the light curve, how the flux change over time from radio to very high energies. And then to try, you try to, you know, to see if all of them change at the same time, or if there is a delay, or if one band is changing, but the other one is not changing. So it, tell you how this, if there is more than one emitting region, how they are connected or not. So this is something that has been, um, for what, I mean, there are many works on it. Uh, here, I, I just uh, include one example. This is uh, one of the uh, famous TV emitters, PKS 1222 plus 21, where we detected very fast variability in the VG band at very, very high energies with the magic telescopes. Uh, the, this uh, very fast variability uh, of the order of nine minutes, in nine minutes, it was changing a factor two in flux. So this is really fast. Um, tell us that the meeting region needs to be very small and that the, the jet could be a structure, can be more than one emitting region, most probably, um, like we see here in the plot in, in the right. And there are many other jobs, other works uh, on this. So we have detected um, evidences that the, the jet should be more complicated than just one single emitting region. So um, from this point of view, um, so quite some work has been, has been done. However, for the spectral variability, from the spectral point of view, let's say we can see a spectral variability, but if uh, there are more than one emitting region, you should see the spectrum like a superposition of the spectrum. However, we never detected um, before uh, such a difference uh, spectra from different regions, okay? This is the work I'm going to present today, which is the first time that such evidence are, are, are found. So let me introduce you to uh, McKinnon 501, this is one of the most famous TV emitters, or so one of the extreme uh, emitters at gamma rays, very close by, located at, at redshift 0.03, so very, very close by, uh, because it can be detected. It's a, it's a permanent uh, em a, a TV um, emitter that can be detected uh, either during flaring state or quiescent state with the current instrumentation that we have. So you can understand the different phases of the of the of the emission, not only during flaring states, but during the whole uh, period, let's say. So we typically organize uh, multi-wavelength um, 
campaigns uh, from radio to camera ray, so including a, la a large number of, of instruments, uh, as you can see here. Uh, especially um, this work at high energies was uh, mainly done with the magic telescope located in, in Canary Islands uh, in Spain. So um, in particular, during 2014, during one of these uh, campaigns, um, there was a very uh, a strong flare. Actually, it was uh, the strongest flare detected by the SWIFT satellite in X-rays. It happened in July uh, 2014. Here you have the, the light curve, and you can see that in July, this is the maximum during, 20, uh, during 16 years. Here you have the multi wavelength light curve of that particular flare. So basically it lasted for, for two weeks. And as you can see, well, this goes from um, radio to gamma rays, so including radio optical X-rays, um, hard X-rays, uh, Fermilat and gamma rays, and magic, in fact, at very high energies. So basically what we can see is that in, in X13, in, 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 um, in X-rays, I think you cannot see the mouse, sorry. So you can see a double peak structure during these two weeks. The same behavior in X-rays and in, um, in uh, gamma rays. Uh, here we have the, what we call fractional variabilities. Basically we estimate how much vary at the different frequency or different energies. So as you can see, um, the, um, the variability during this flare um, increase with the, with the energy. So it is more variable uh, in gamma rays uh, and then uh, in X-rays and optical and radio uh, maybe. Um, basically this, uh, this is what we call uh, a spectral energy distribution where you have from radio to very high energies in, in gamma rays. So the color points represent the flare, the data from the flare, where you can see there are there is variability the, during these two weeks. And in gray, you can see archival data. Just in order to have an idea on how much or at which level was the, the source at that uh, period. And again, you can see that um, the source was in very high state. You can see uh, the range of variability in, uh, in, in the X-ray band where the blue are really on the top. For comparison, this source has um, an historical flare. In 1997, it was very, very strong. Uh, and it was very interesting to test the emission models, et cetera. And this uh, a new flare in 2014 actually was at the same level or similar level to this historical flare. So basically, this is the maximum that this source do, of course, during our during the, the studies of the last 30 years of, that we have been uh, observing in, in X-rays and in, in gamma rays, uh, where well, you can see that you know it reaches really the maximum. Uh, it is an historical uh, flare. Here we have um, the evolution night by night, uh, the multi wetland spectral energy distribution um, daily, let's say, or nightly. Um, so we uh, fitted uh, the, the data with a standard uh, emission model. I will not enter in details because we don't have time, but it is called one zone synchrotron semiconductor model, which is represented by the black line. And you can see that can explain the, the pretty well the, uh, the emission. So basically this flare, I mean this flare, we kind of um, assume just one emitting region within the relativistic jet. And you can be quite convinced that you could explain the emission with just one emitting region within the jet, except for this thing here. So it is one of the days of the flare. So July, the night from July 19 to July 20th of 2024. Um, and basically you can see that in the, X, in the gamma ray, uh, in the gamma ray uh, spectrum at the very end, as marked by the arrow, you can see that there is a, a, a small bump. There are a few points that are over the expected shape uh, uh, of the spectrum. Okay, so 
uh, we started to investigate if it is just a fluctuation uh, with, uh, and, and nothing more, or if uh, it is something significant, right? So there are three points about uh, the line, let's say. Uh, actually, this happened, this particular night, is marked here with the vertical um, uh, line. So basically, uh, this night correspond to the highest uh, flux and, and the, the strongest X-ray uh, spectrum uh, during the whole uh, mission, during the whole campaign. So it was a very particular night as well. It's, it's not just a, a random uh, position. Okay, and this uh, spectrum here, we have on the top the observed spectrum uh, with a couple of, of, of peaks, uh, basically a power or a, 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 a log parabola. Uh, in the second top in blue, uh, it's represented the EVL corrected. So basically this the absorb or after correction of sun absorption um, that are, are affecting the gamma ray uh, spectrum due to the external active background light. And at the bottom line, uh, so basically you can see the comparison between three days. So this particular day where we see this extra component or possible extra component, the previous night and the night after. So basically what we can see is that, uh, first of all, this absorption due to the external active background light is not creating this artifact let's say, and that uh, it seems that the, this extra component or feature in the spectrum is compatible with a duration of three days, although the, the strongest was the night of the 19 to the 20. But as you can see, the, the different spectra are, are compatible uh, with this uh, feature. So the first uh, test that we did was to, um, to basically uh, fit with the classical functions that we typically fit uh, the, the gamma ray uh, spectrum from lasers, which is basically power law, log parabola, an exponential log, uh, log parabola. So basically you are allowing some curvature in the spectrum. And here at the end, well, and we did that for the observed spectrum and for the EVL corrected or deabsorbed spectrum. So basically you have at the end of the table marked in red, which is the probability to discard such a, a fit. And as you can see, depending on the a priori assumptions, which are the typical functions that we typically use. Um, so the significance for the rejection for, for a not good fit will go from almost five sigma to three sigma. Okay, in our field, because, uh, because of the technique we use to, to observe, we typically require five sigma for a detection of a new thing, uh, because there are many systematics that are difficult to control, et cetera. So we require pretty high uh, significance. Still, about three sigma is a pretty interesting evidence, okay? So we are in this range between five and three, okay? Um, so what else? Uh, after this test, which looks promising, uh, it seems that the probability that such a thing is just, uh, you know, fluctuation is not very likely, uh, but still, so what we did was to, to perform a likelihood ratio test where we compare two functions. One is a log parabola, allowing some curvature of the spectrum. And the second thing to prove is of to compare with the log parabola is a log parabola plus an additional narrow function that will explain uh, the extra component if real. So uh, after doing this uh, comparisons for both the observed and the deabsorbed spectrum, uh, as you can see, what we get is a significance for the preference of the uh, an extra component in the spectrum at the level of 4.5 sigma or 3.9 sigma for depending if you do it with the observed spectrum or after correcting this deabsorption using uh, models. So uh, it seems that, you know, it is uh, evidence we cannot 
set it in the stone. It is now five sigma, and this is typically the required uh, values we say, but it's extremely interesting. Okay, this is the first time that uh, such kind of um, possible extra component are, are seen directly from the, from the spectrum. As I say, there are many evidences from the light curves. So we think, we already think that more than one component should be there, but uh, we, did, we did not see that from the spectrum, okay? So this is the first time that such a, an evidence is found. Furthermore, um, so we did some uh, Monte Carlo simulations. So we simulate uh, 10,000 realizations of the spectrum. And we, uh, we did the, we performed the, the, the same test. We compare a uh, uh, log parabola and a log parabola plus an extra component. Uh, so basically the idea is to understand if randomly, if you don't have, I mean, and, and, and without fixing the peak position, not, it doesn't need to be at the position that we observe it, uh, at any position in the, in the spectrum, how likely it is that just by chance, uh, there is some fluctuation that uh, can look like uh, an extra component, but it's just a fluctuation. Uh, so basically what we did, is, uh, as I said, 10,000 realization, and for each realization we fit we move the, or we scan the, the parameter space, putting this extra component at different energies. As you can see the different lines uh, in, in, in colors represent different fields. In this particular case, I'm sharing the real data, but for comparison, uh, but we did that for, as I said, for 10,000 uh, realization of random spectrum. And what we find uh, is, uh, as you can see in this table, is that from these simulations, uh, we get a significance of 3.6 sigma uh, for the observed spectrum, and for the uh, EVL corrected, it is 3.3 sigma. So basically, as we discussed before, we are the level of 4 uh, to 3 sigma uh, for the evidence. Okay, so up to here, this is what the observations look like. So. We cannot say much more than that. Uh, we did many tests. Uh, it seems there are good chances that it is real, that it is a detection. Uh, we have a significance between three and five sigma, depending on the method we, we used to, to check. If real, how can we explain, um, how can we interpret uh, the emission? So basically we present in this paper uh, published last year, um, we present three emission models. So one of it, uh, one option is the, a pile up in the electron distribution. So the particle distribution that is responsible for the emission. If there is a narrow band where more emission is, is, in, is input, then you get such a feature. Uh, there is the possibility, as we discussed it before, that there are these two emitted region within the jet and basically um, you have a, this kind of a structured jet. Uh, and there is also the possibility that um, you have the typical emitted region within the jet and then a population of electrons are highly accelerated, very close to the, magnetic, to, to the um, black hole in what we call magnetospheric vacuum gap. And then it can produce this peak uh, at higher energies. So just to finalize, so basically, as I say, this is an historical event that, um, where we found uh, the first evidences for an arrow spectral uh, component that is centered at very high energies of three TVs and uh, three possible uh, theoretical scenarios can explain this emission. Thank you very much for your attention and I will be very happy to get any questions or comments you might have.